You're a wireless operator? No, a tail gunner. Tail gunner. There's a twin engine out there. Got the tour in too. You got, yeah. <laughs> Where? So when you see the enemy coming, would they come like from above or from below? From below. You say below. Six o'clock. Daylight above. But I was night. I always stood in the dark. The remembrances of military operations past. Of all my medals, this is the only one that really counts. The wings? The wings. That shows one tour. Service that was extraordinary. And a machine that history measures as unequaled. The Lancaster Bomber, 70 years after its prime, still a sight that inspires awe. Awe among an ever dwindling generation who knows the plane intimately, and awe among the generations who follow and really don't have a clue. Good to go. Good. Fuel gauges. Contact check recorded. Fuel management. Start on ones, fly on twos. Hydraulic pressure gauge. Is it zero? With four engines, so heavy, so powerful, the Lancaster became the workhorse bomber of the Second World War. And chocks. So effective, more than 7,000 were eventually built, including hundreds in Canada. Get ready on board. A prime four, priming four. Today, only two still fly. A privilege to be able to catch a ride, whether it's a once in a lifetime experience or a little more often, like pilot Dave Rohr. What's it like taxiing this thing? Yeah, I mean, you've flown so many different planes. What's it like doing this? This is the hardest airplane I've ever had to taxi. <laughs> this is a. It, this airplane will keep you honest. Uh, it's a good uh, test of piloting skills both on the ground and in the air. In fact, maybe more on the ground. When you're up there in the, in the sky, what goes through your mind? Well, what goes through my mind, Peter, is uh, the first thing is the, the honor and the privilege it is to be able to fly this iconic airplane. And, and to do it in honor of all those young men and women who built the airplane, maintained the airplane, flew the airplane in combat in the prime of their lives. And then, uh, it's an honor for us to be able to represent that legacy and to, and to present it to Canadians today. So it's a real privilege. That's what's in my mind at all times. You know. Flying in the famous Lancaster, the Lank, every moment to be savored, because this for me is a personal journey too. More about that later. But first, a couple of indelible observations. It is cramped in here and penetratingly loud. And while it may be relatively smooth flying over southern Ontario today, you can't help but imagine what it must have been like seven decades ago over Nazi-occupied Europe, taking fire from above, under attack from below, caught in the middle of the fury of war. And you're never safe until you turned off the runway. Among the few still able to share first-hand accounts, 91-year-old Noel Shanks. I knew the chances were pretty slim just to uh, fly in a, in a raid, it was 50-50. He was just a skinny kid from Charbot Lake, Ontario, back when he became a tail gunner in a lank. Flight Sergeant Shanks squeezed into the rear of what was really just a big, vulnerable tin can. Mission after mission, as the Allies readied the invasion, he defied the odds, even when the lank was hit by enemy fire. The aircraft went into a vertical dive. 
out of control. And we're going down uh, over 400 miles per hour towards Earth. And we had to get straightened out to get up. But what they're afraid of were the pulling the wings off. So anyway, we recovered at about 9,000 feet. But we had uh, holes in the uh, uh, wings, or you could have put a, put a bathtub in them. June 6th, see what June 6th had to say. Shank scrolled the word D-Day into his logbook after the fact. At the time, he says, that day, that mission was like all the others, almost. They wanted to keep it a secret. Went to the briefing, and uh, they uh, were laying it on pretty thick to be on time and accurate and keep your eyes open. You're going to see a lot of activity both in the air and in the, in the sea. Being in the rear, I had the best view because it lasted a long time. And you can see all these boats circling around. There's the sword beach and where we bombed on that day, Ostraham. For the record, Shanks says they hit their target on D-Day. A heavy German installation of big guns. They returned to base in England and carried right on bombing for a total of 30 missions. For Shanks, that meant tour of duty over. I was likely scared and didn't lose that scare until I got out. I don't think you're as scared so much as wanting to, to live. <laughs> War being war, for every story of those who made it, there are, of course, the stories of those who did not. Lancasters that never returned from bombing runs, and the airmen who vanished. The sad thing about all his medals is because he didn't survive the war, he never got to wear them. Like Sharon and Herb Rieger's uncle. Flight Lieutenant Herbert Rieger was barely out of his teens, with a sweetheart back home in Hamilton when he was posted to the RAF overseas went to bathtub, had a couple of drinks, picked up by two girls, then Van H and Dewey made off with them. Quite glad I didn't. His journal recording the personal experiences of wartime, of a young man's hopes. There's nothing here whatsoever to equal Joyce. Hope I make it home again to take up where I left off with her. And a young bomb aimer's fears. The reality for him and so many others, of course, the future was unknown. Oh, look at this one here. Bad news on May 4th, 1944. Ross Ellesmere didn't come back from raid last night. Will write to his parents and his girlfriend. 1,000 aircraft sent out, 42 are missing. Bomber Command operated against Cologne, Brussels, and two other Rye targets in France. The 1,100 aircraft were sent out, 16 are missing. Then, on June 6, 1944, it was Rieger's Lancaster that went missing, shot down after a dawn attack on a German coastal battery. The plane long presumed swallowed up by the English Channel. And my father would tell us on his birthday, oh, today is Herb's birthday, this is how old he would be. And on D-Day, he would just say, this is a sad day. You know, being the eldest, you're sort of aware of what the adults are saying. And his sister Peggy or Irene saying, I wonder what happened to her. I wish we knew. And, you know, now they've all passed on and we've just found out now. Just found out that the Lancaster didn't disappear into the water after all, but crashed on land. It was only about a year and a half ago, a British aviation archaeologist discovered the wreckage of a Lancaster in a farmer's field, not far from the beaches invaded 70 years ago. Found too, an inscribed ring, a clue vital to putting names to the flight crew on board, which included Canadian Herbert Rieger. I think it was more of finding closure, because I wondered if he was a prisoner of war. I wondered if he was you know, in the bottom of the English Channel. 
I was surprised it took them so long to find it. Especially in this time of day in this world, that something that could stay buried that long. The airmen's bodies are likely in unmarked graves, but personal items have turned up at the excavation site. Among them, a cigarette case the Rieger family now wonders about. Said goodbye to Joyce at night. Try to make it as easy as possible, but it was almost impossible. She gave me a very lovely cigarette case. Could it be the cigarette cases are one and the same? Sharon Rieger has solved some mysteries on her own, like the wonder of flight. Aviation in her blood, more than a decade ago, she earned her pilot's license. It's what led her to offer some poignant words of advice to me, to take a moment, really think about, really feel what it must have been like for my father, that's right, a navigator in a Lancaster during the chaos of war. Stanley Mansbridge flew with the Royal Air Force, starting out as a novice in smaller two-engine planes, graduating eventually to the heavy, much lauded Lank. The missions he flew critical to the Allied war effort, including Peenemunde, where the Germans were developing secret weapons, a raid that may have changed the course of the war, but also came at great sacrifice. We lost a third of our aircraft on that attack. As we now know from post-war historical records, it was a very successful raid. It deferred the uh, German launching of the V-1 and uh, V-2 attacks on the Allies and consequently would have saved a, a vast number of civilian lives. For his service, Wing Commander Mansbridge was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. And on this occasion, a decoration I saw fitting to keep close. It's all quite humbling. This brief scenic adventure in one of the very vehicles that helped deliver liberation in Europe so many years ago. To imagine the resilience, the maneuverability of this hulk of a flying machine, but also the deadly force that could be launched from its belly. And of course, the harsh truth about bravery. That as an airman, the chance of surviving one tour of duty in a lank, let alone more, was a gamble. Oh, here comes Peter. Yeah, I want to see. Congratulations. I'll tell you, that was Just quite something. 29 more to go. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all, all we had to do was, uh, was dodge the uh, beauty of Southern Ontario. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you to go through it because it's, it's, such, a, it's such cramped quarters, right? Very. <laughs> yeah. When you're, when you're here and you hear those engines oh, start up, it's music. what do you think of? <laughs> I think of just after takeoff. And I can I can still see that or that feel, you know, as you're going right. along. But the most important sound, Peter, was when and they pull those four engines back and they backfire like everything, yeah. you know, and then bang, you're on the ground. Right back on that the ground. was the best sound going. After six, seven, eight hours, hours sometimes. That's right. Well, it was an honor to fly on that plane and it's an honor to meet you again. <laughs> well, Thank you so much. It's Really, I really enjoyed today. So I'm just going to say hello to Sharon. Thank you. That was, I did exactly what you told me to do. Did you? I, you closed you know, your I eyes? I closed my eyes and I thought of my dad and what it must have been like for him. So I was doing that for you too. Thank you. For your uncle. Thank you. What yes. was it like for you to hear those engines and To watch hear it the go? engines at the very beginning when on the tarmac, when it was just starting up, I just had butterflies on my stomach, sort of feeling what they must have felt. And when it landed, it was sort of like, oh, a relief. They're back in one piece. And we said that to each other, too. Well, I hope you get the opportunity someday to, to go for a, a flight because Thank it is you. quite remarkable. And it, it connects you with not only the country's past, 
Yes. And history uh, connects yes. you with your personal past, yes. as it did for me and as I know it would for you. Well, I'm glad you did that. I'm okay. glad you did that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.